Welcome to Let's Get Writing. I'm your host, Catherine Taylor, coming to you from central Newfoundland, Canada. And this is the show about the stories behind the stories, the things you don't know. You can buy the books, but you don't always know about the author. So today we're going to jump into the life of another wonderful author who was born in St. John's, Newfoundland, and she studied visual arts at Sir Wilford Grenfell College in Cornerbrook, and she has been a printmaker ever after, and she also became an author. So we're going to learn a little about her journey. Her name is Lori Duty, and I'm going to bring Lori up in the stream and welcome her to the show. Hi, Lori. How are you? Good. How are you? I'm great, and it's such a pleasure to have you here. I have to say I have been looking at your books and reading them and wishing that I had young children again or grandchildren. <laughs> hint, hint. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, Lori, your books are absolutely beautiful, and they're so popular with, with families, and, and you've been recognized for your art and your work, and I'm sure people are delighted to meet you. Um, so I think first question, describe your art. I, I mean, I think folk art, but how do you see your art? Um, I would call it kind of nouveau minimalism. Um, I do make them look, um, simplified and more of a graphic aesthetic that would, would be considered folk art. Um, I do skew the perspectives and flatten the imagery. Um, I don't know. I just, when I started doing the books, I started making artwork more like what I made as a child before I went to art school. <laughs> so I kind of threw out all the rules that I learned there and developed an illustration style for my books. Yeah. And when you say that, and I, I, I think about it um, when I look at the, the, the books and we're going to have a look at some of the images shortly, it, it's that simplification. And I think that gives it that, I don't know that, and it leaves room for your imagination to take over. And I, I'm thinking maybe that's what appeals so much to children, the brightness of the color and just the possibility for them to be within that image almost. Um, it, it, it looks like it's peeking right inside their imaginations to me. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'm glad. <laughs> so what... Um, what inspired you to start writing books? You, first, you went to Grenfell College. In mm -hmm. Let's put in a little plug for Grenfell College because we have some wonderful arts here in Newfoundland. Mm -hmm. How was that whole experience for you? Uh, pretty wonderful. It's um, I was one of the earlier classes. I think they might have still been working out some of the kinks. Um, but you got to do sculpture, photography, printmaking, painting, drawing. Um, there wasn't really a lot of... Um, graphic design at that point. Um, I remember the first time I used a digital camera, I had to use a tripod for it. <laughs> so that kind of dates me. <laughs> okay. um, <laughs> so um, it was a great experience. It was four years of um, just learning how to build an art practice and how to um, continue once you left the school. Um, it's kind of daunting. I remember when I was in school, I remember thinking, was this how European explorers felt going out across the Atlantic Ocean, not knowing if they would just drop off the face of the earth or would they find something and uh, make something of their you know, journey. Lori, that is a conversation I had with myself while taking my English degree with <laughs> a minor in art and every theater course and writing course that I could take at Acadia University at the time. And everyone would say, oh, you're gonna, you're gonna go into teaching. I was like, no, I don't see myself as a teacher. So it was the same thing. What am I going to do? And I think all of us who start out as artists, whatever whatever practice we follow, always feel like that. How, how will we find our way? It's not defined. And yeah, it's, I even remember thinking nothing is really going to come of it till I'm in my 40s. <laughs> I know <laughs> this is a long, long haul, and it's something that I have to just keep doing and I am in my 40s now, and it's starting to pay off. And here you go. And don't, don't you feel, I, I think just part of me felt that growing up in school or what I see now, I think our schools could be more supportive to those of us who are going to work in the arts. I, I mean, we're never going to 
we're never going to drift likely into science or aspects of technology, of course, like I do digital media. <laughs> you know, I felt like that was lacking and I, I hope it's changed, but I really don't know if it has. I was very lucky. Um, I had some very supportive art teachers and my kids now are in school and um, they do get to do art classes. Um, and of course, there's so many things available, especially if you live in a bigger city um, to do classes with art centers or galleries. Um, I think people are more open to it. When I first started out, I got the term artsy fartsy a lot. Um, it was <laughs> it's a little condescending. I don't know what it has to do with having gas. <laughs> um, <laughs> So that I've noticed that that phrase has faded away, and I'm glad. Yeah, I'm glad too. I hear, I do hear it sometimes. I think it's because our work is just it's different. Yeah, it's not as tangible, and it's different. And so, um, but it's good to hear those things. And I, I had a lot of wonderful teachers. And for teachers who are out there, please don't ever stop being those wonderful people for students because I know there have been so many challenges to that profession over the past few years, but the tremendous impact you can have on those in front of you. Um, there's just, it's so important. And Absolutely. Uh, yeah, that's what really, and I can think back to several teachers that I know were part of why I'm doing what I'm doing now. And mm -hmm. I'm sure the same was with you. So now we've covered the education system. We've talked a little bit about your education. What inspires you? How, how do you come up with your ideas? And what are you going to write about? Yeah. With the books, um, it was a, a long journey. I didn't actually grow up with many picture books. Um, it wasn't really part of my family's culture. I just remember discovering them in kindergarten in the school library. And um just pouring and pouring over them and not being able to read them. Um, I was one of the, also one of the first early classes of French immersion that were uh, in St. John's and it was very French focused. Uh, we didn't learn to read English until grade three. Um, so I was, even now I sometimes tend to put things in French uh, sentence structure <laughs> um, and I have to think of how to spell things in French or English like blue and bleu is just torture. <laughs> um, but <laughs> it took a while to um, for me to, get to picture books. I remember liking them as a child. And then all of a sudden when I turned nine, when I could read English, it was all novels all the time. Um, I kind of fell face and eyes into the Anna Green Gables series and that was it. And I didn't really pay attention to picture books again until I had children. Um, they, my son in particular was very active. Uh, when he was four, he would be awake for 16, 17 hours straight and just moving, moving, moving. And the only way to get him to sit down was to look at a picture book with me. And so um, at the end of every day, when I couldn't handle any more of the moving and the fidgeting, um, we would take out some three, four or five picture books and we would spend a half hour and my daughter as well, who's a few years younger, would climb up on my lap and we would have this lovely quiet and still <laughs> time looking at books. And um, after a while, I kept really falling in love with some of the books and wishing that I could make something like that for other families or for my family as well. And then one day I just sat down and decided, I guess I'm learning how to make a picture book. <laughs> um, so then I had to learn how to write a book. Um, even though picture books are very short, um, you have to be succinct and you have to get to the point. You have one page for exposition. You have to um, develop a conflict. You have to resolve the conflict. Um, so that took a few years to figure out. In very few words. <laughs> Because when I look at your books, there are very few words there. And so as a writer, you're going through the same thing that writers who write novels are doing with fewer words. Mm -hmm. yeah, many fewer words. <laughs> to get right to the point. <laughs> but you can get that point across, too, in, 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 your, in your images. And yes. I think that, that uh, that's where the imagination takes off. And so generally what... So we know your children were part of your motivation and your sanity. <laughs> Establish that. What, um, you know, what did you pick? I'm thinking your age is a very young reader. Maybe what age exactly? You tell me. Um, I keep a few readers in mind. I keep the ones that can't read at all, like how I couldn't read English till I was eight. Um, so the pictures help with that. Um, they tell the story as well. Um, I keep in mind um, 
the child that likes having a story read to them. Um, my kids loved it. And, um, but I also keep in mind the poor parent who has to read the book every single night, possibly for three months in a row. <laughs> um, they have to read it out loud, so it can't, um, it can't be hard to read out loud. That keeps the language fairly simple. And um, it can't get on their nerves, essentially. <laughs> so it's entertaining a few audiences at the same time. Um, but yeah, and to do that, you have to keep the language simple. You have to get it straight to the point. You have to, you can't have any little sidebars in your story. Well, you know, and that brings me to your, your, your stories are very popular with families. They love your work. And so do they ever tell you particularly what they, what they enjoy? I'm sure you must have conversations with them. Um, one of my favorite things is um, that people send me pictures of, say, a two-year-old just looking at the book. They can't read it on their own, but they're, you know, reading it. <laughs> um, or of uh, family sitting together and reading them as a group. Um, yeah, people love them. The general idea, too, that all of them end rather cheerfully and there's a nice conclusion because right after they finish the book, they're going to bed. And I'm, I want them to have a nice feeling as they're going to bed. Well, I've, I've just put up your ad, your handle for Instagram and uh, Facebook. And I noticed you have, especially Instagram, of course, so many images there. People want to check that out. And uh, it's nice to know that you like to, to get the feedback from your readers as well. Send along those photographs of, of yourselves reading the book. Send them to Lori. It's inspiration for you. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. That's so nice. Um, so you also have quite a career as an artist and you, um, you are displayed at galleries. I actually have a list of them. You are at the Emma Butler Gallery in St. John's, the Bell's Fine Art Gallery in Halifax, Nova Scotia. You are at Gallery 78 in Fredericton and uh, Art Interiors in Toronto and the Michel Nero Gallery in mm -hmm. York City. Wow. <laughs> you are really covering uh, some territory here. Mm -hmm. So what are the, the what, what, how is the artwork that we would, might find in these galleries? Is it similar to your books? Is it different? Tell us about it. <laughs> it is different. Um, once you're in a commercial gallery, there's often group shows, so there'll be themes. So last summer I was asked to be in a floral show and it Luckily, I had some floral images. Um, the New York Gallery really likes fashion imagery, which kind of makes sense. Um, each gallery has their own preferences and their own price ranges. So you I kind of have to cater to what each gallery wants. Um, the Toronto Gallery prides itself on being affordable artwork. So the pieces are small, um, accessible. So yeah, it changes with every gallery. Mm -hmm. And do you, uh, what, what's your medium? What do you work with when you're creating? Um, I, for many, many years, I've mostly worked in etching, which is a printmaking process. You use a printing press um, and copper plates that you etch imagery into. Um, but once I had children, it became too difficult to go to a print shop. <laughs> Although I keep joking that maybe they could be my assistants now that they're older. Um, but once they came along, I started doing mostly drawings and acrylic paintings. And that's what happened with the picture books as well. Mm. And, you know, um, I could really see the link between you and running the goat books because I have had Marnie on the show here and uh, their approach and her approach um, with that company is to create such beautiful books and also um, in the way that they're also printed. I mean, she has some incredible older presses there and mm -hmm. I, I to catch up with her again to find out what's in use and how she's doing things but I'm sure it's pretty modern these days but her passion I think for imagery and in that sort of thing is is that what led you to running the goat books or how did you end up there um well I knew Marnie uh, from St. Michael's print shop which is an artist run center in downtown St. John's um, she's a member there I was a member and we knew some of the same artists um, but we were actually at a printmaking fair um in, at the Rocket Room in downtown St. John's. And she had recently written, I can't remember if it was an article or a blog post about being kind of a renaissance of picture books right now. And uh, that was just when I was beginning to get first drafts together of my uh, picture books, my very first one, the, uh, which is called Cape Weather. And I just 
we just started talking about picture books and she said, send it on over. <laughs> so I did and it worked out. Yeah, it sure did work out because I think you have 10 books now with, with them. Yes. Yeah. In, in six years, which is kind of a crazy amount. Yeah, it's a lot, a lot of artwork too, and a lot of creating. Wow, it's wonderful. So now when, um, when you get an idea for a book and we have that time frame of six years, you must work fairly quickly, but what's that process like for you? Um, usually I'll just get a, an idea for a character or a situation and then I'll see if I can make it into a picture book, really. I'll write it out, um, do some sketches. I have a, an awful lot of half picture books made <laughs> where it was a good idea, but it, it won't fill out the, the 32 pages or so needed. Um, so it's just a matter of sketching things out. It's a, it's a little different for me with writing because it's writing and illustrating at the same time. Most picture books are an author is one person and the illustrator is a different person. And oftentimes they never even meet while the book is being made. So with me, I can go back and forth. And um, so yeah, not every picture book gets finished, but when they do, um, then I'll try and work on a little bit more. It can take as little as two months or it can take a year. Mm -hmm. Just kind of depending on how that, how it rolls, how yes. inspiration. <laughs> and I want to, I want to mention to you, we're going to, we are going to look at some of your books, but I, I want to also mention what I think is really interesting. You have fabric as well, not only your artwork and your books, and you are um, with the East Coast Quilt Company. Yes. Tell me about that. <laughs> so, um, one of my daughter's favorite things to do is to just go downtown and go into stores, um, particularly stores with dogs. <laughs> so I can shop and she sits down with the dog that works at the store and we have a grand time. And at East Coast Quilting Company, they always had a Labrador retriever called Tucker. And so we always had to go say hi to Tucker and Tucker's owner, Reed. And um, Reed and I got to talking about um, picture books and uh, the store started carrying them and then at one point we were talking about the end papers of picture books which are the kind of decorative sheets at the front and the end and I said how it was a lot like fabric design and a light went off <laughs> for everyone <laughs> so um, the fabric designs are closely related to my picture books they're in the same style um, some of the same subject matter there's a the puffins uh, from the puffin problem are directly on a fabric design. Um, the houses are done the same as in the books. And we have more fabrics coming out soon. Wow. So, so your, your images should, could show up on quilts, dresses, clothing for kids. Yeah. Ooh, Cushions, wow. napkins, tablecloths. Yeah. How cool would that be? Uh, you know, you give your, your child the book and, and you give them an outfit that coordinates with their book. I mean, for, for young kids, that'd be pretty fun. Yeah. Or a reading cushion. Yeah. Or, yeah. Or a, a, a doll that's dressed in fabric from the book. Yeah. Very, very interesting. And so, and so, and so creative again, which almost brings you back to with, with you start, you started with um, sort of printmaking and it's almost like printing, but I did go on to the website or the Facebook page for the East coast quilt company. And there are some pictures there. It's very fun. And that liveliness is there. So again, you can reach out to Lori through her social media handles, Lori duty picture book maker. <laughs> That's a pretty good title. I think it's, I think it says it all. Yeah, so, it's a bit of a mouthful. <laughs> let's have a look at some of these books. I'm going to um, rearrange us, and I'm not sure um, which way this will do. Um, so um, I've got my dog in the background there. <laughs> <laughs> one of them, one of the poodles. Um, so here we see the cover for the story, The Island. And according to Running the Goat, I think this book is available now. Um, and it's your latest book. Um, and it's all about resettlement. And yeah, will you tell us a little bit? <laughs> How did this come about? It is different from my other books. Um, this came out of trying to explain to my kids that my mother used to live on a small island where there was no electricity, no plumbing, that they had animals. Um, that they took care of um, that was very different from when she was little to now when they were they were little 
Um, and I remember my son asking, did they move so that they could have TV? <laughs> I said, not exactly. And I tried to explain as gently as possible um, that they had to move, they had no choice. Um, but uh, that gave me the idea for a picture book. And um, at first I had no idea how to do it. I thought maybe I could do my mother's story of her family. Um, they really held on, they, they really didn't wanna move. Um, they pretty much had to move because there was hardly anyone left on the island, including no school teachers. Um, and my grandparents had three small children at the time. And of course they wanted their kids to go to school. So they made the move. Um, but I just couldn't figure out how to do that as a picture book that would entertain children or parents for that matter, or grandparents that would share the book with them. So um, I kind of just left it at that and thought, well, that's one of those ideas, I guess that won't work out. Um, and then a couple of years later, I thought, well, maybe if I did kind of personification with the island itself, where the island is sad or the island misses its people. And then that seemed too hokey. So it was again, back in the cabinet of ideas that won't happen. And then one day during the early month of COVID lockdown, I was walking my dog and I just wrote this story in my head um, that shows um, a, not an actual community that was resettled, it's an imaginary island. Um, but it just came together and I kind of came home with my dog and went in a room and scribbled it all down. And I was like, I guess that's the book. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, so it took a while longer to figure out the imagery. Um, again, I, it's an imaginary island, so I, could, I was kind of free to do whatever I wanted. Um, and I decided on doing, a, a, a really pushing the folk style. I was thinking back to um, some paintings that my great uncle did when he was trying to remember um, placement of houses on the island where he lived. Mm -hmm. It's Colonnette Island for my mother's family. And um, yeah, he was trying to remember whose house was next to whose. And he was doing these paintings that were almost, well, he had no training. So there was the perspective was very flat. And I thought I could use that idea um, and just kind of push it. And uh, so that's how the island happened. Wow. And I love to get inside sort of your creative process, drawing on your family's history and and again, this has become, I think, a, a very gentle tale about the importance of home and living where we do in Newfoundland and Labrador and people from here are spread so far and wide around the world. There's always that very gentle tug about the importance of what is home here. And I think we can all relate to how people on an island being relocated would feel there would always be that tug back and exactly yeah and and i mean even with children today um you know people move around more so it might not be leaving an island but it could be leaving their town and leaving their friends it's all that same feeling moving from uh the country into an urban setting all of that especially when you're growing up these are big things yeah um, you always remember your childhood home yeah, you do. You do. And I actually, I want to just, I, I was trying to get everything up in order. I'm just going to jump really quickly back and everybody gets to see these beautiful images again and cover to the sad little island that we did. You did more with gray and uh, er, the buildings are starting to lose their color. And then here we go. And this is like, I guess, a nighttime scene. So it just leaves you with that feeling of kind of a little loneliness, I guess. I remember my mother mentioning that once how she she remembers the, the lights going out on the island, how the houses were dark and how the lights were appearing across the bay where people had moved. And so I wanted to incorporate that image into this book. Yeah. Well, you did tug the heartstrings there. And let's, <laughs> let's cheer things up again. Let's have a look at a few more of your, uh, let's see if we can get her. Mr. Beagle, this is a series that you do. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. And he's a, he's a great character. I had some fun reading those books and getting to know him. He's, uh, he's great. So dogs appear and, and, and mm -hmm. some fun is set in a uh, rabbit town, which I had mm -hmm. never heard of rabbit town. <laughs> you literally put the rabbits in there. Yes. And um, I remember walking through rabbit town one day. It's a uh, St. John's neighborhood um, and thinking, huh. Oh, that's a good idea for a picture book <laughs> and didn't go back to it for a while. And then I remembered um, that beagles when I was growing up were, were called rabbit dogs. So 
then it came together where a rabbit dog would go to rabbit town. Yeah, maybe not a welcome one. Yeah. <laughs> Only when it started out. And it's so funny, I, when I started out, I had beagles. And I've switched to um, having poodles as my companions. Um, a poodle, and, like um, one of my books, Lana Lama. There's a okay. poodle that's featured. <laughs> and also another, um, this one's about a moose, which is very much part of our culture. <laughs> mallard, mallard moose. I think we'll get to Lana Lama. Mm -hmm. And uh, your, you like it, your characters or your yes, characters as you create them are just so lovely and um, inviting. And we're back to the island again. But uh, um, just, just so engaging. And I think people can see from the little sample we've given them, um, you know, how much fun it would be to share these books with family members and uh and get engaged. So we know they're available through running the goat books and, and I guess every other place where fine books are, are sold mm -hmm. um, and online. So that's a wonderful way. And we can keep up with your activities through your um, social media. And do you do in-person readings? Um, I haven't since COVID. Um, I know that I have an event uh, for the AC Hunter Library in July. It's uh, at the Arts and Culture Center in St. John's. I know I'm doing something there. <laughs> and I'll probably try to do more um, outdoor events this summer. Coming up, yeah, because I would think hearing you read your books and, and being there, um, do, you, do you bring any artwork with you when you go or just? Um, I usually bring coloring sheets so that afterwards um, that we can kind of hang out and the kids can ask me questions and color. Uh, All right. yeah, well, so. I tell you can send me along some I saw I looked at the pink the pink flamingo book and I don't have an image of that but I loved it I'm a member of the secret order of the pink flamingo <laughs> too. many years ago when we were on the hunt for pink flamingos the kind that move around from yard to yard not the real ones but you had a real one showed up in St. John's in your book <laughs> And everyone was making it feel welcome. Well, Lori, thank you so much for your time today. It, it has been a pleasure to learn your process and to, to get to know you better. And I hope um, our audiences have enjoyed it. I'm sure they have. Thank you for having me. Oh, it's a pleasure. And uh, keep writing, keep drawing. <laughs> and we'll keep looking for more beautiful books from you. Thank you so much for being on Let's Get Writing today. <laughs>